Hello, everyone. This is Kim Doherty, and I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, webcast slash workshop this evening. We're going to be focusing on connecting who you are with what you do. And, and to put this into a context that might be more familiar to you, um, I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience of someone telling you in a relationship where either you're breaking up with them or they're breaking up with you, really, it's not you, it's me. Well, when it comes to understanding your relationship with a job, a lot of times it is very similar to that. So we're going to look at how to do the best job we can of matching up who we are and what we have to offer in a job situation with the jobs that allow us to thrive at the, our highest level of contribution. So just very quickly, why is it important to do this? Here's why I think it's important. When you think about a career, you're looking at a really long sort of um, horizon of time, of engagement, of activities, of different employers, different experiences. And what we hope is that over that amount of time and, and change, we get closer and closer to being in our ideal best fit job. So when we go through the process we're going to talk about tonight, what it helps you do is to understand what work is best aligned with who you are. It'll help you understand what's working and what's not working. And that's really important because it's easy to mistake I'm not happy in this job and therefore I don't like this kind of work with actually I'm great at this type of work, but it's the environment that's not working for me. So we're gonna sort of suss out what, what the differences are there. By being able to do that, you can understand better how to fix what's not working for you. And especially important because my guess is you may go through a number of career transitions, the more you know about what works best for you, the more effectively you will be able to navigate those career transitions. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Types of self-assessments and how to use them. Um, top 10 ways to explore what your best fit career opportunities might be, and then how you can use those preferences once you're able to identify the ones that are relevant to you, how you can use those to help you shape your career choices and paths. So hopefully this will, will get you closer and closer, even while you're in the grad school program, to the types of career choices that are the ones that you will be best suited for and happiest with. So here's the bottom line. Yep, you are special. Not like in a snowflakey kind of way, but special in that you have unique attributes, capabilities, strengths, those kinds of things that mean you're different in terms of what you can contribute but also what will help you thrive than the other people in your lives or the other people you're in classes with or the other people you work with. So as you think about how do we figure this out, my first point is that it's an ongoing process. You will change in terms of who you are, what you need from your job, uh, what your personal preferences and priorities are over the course of your career. So what you would be looking at now would be responses that mark a point in time in your life and your career. The reason I think this is really important to point out is that what you learn in grad school is a starting point. It's a starting point for your knowledge base, but it's also a starting point for you as a professional, and you are going to continue to grow with every experience you have. So if you look at 
personality assessment results, you consider strengths and weaknesses and all. I'm sorry that I left weaknesses in there, but we'll get to that. Um, you think about personal preferences. Those are the ones that best suit you today. Assume that 10 years from now, they could look very, very different than what you, you would consider or the results that you discover as we go through this process right now. Additionally, one of the most important things you can be doing while you're a student is thinking about your responses to your courses because they will help you understand, yes, I love doing this kind of work or that doesn't really interest me or, oh my gosh, um, you know, just shoot me now if I ever had to do this again on a job. So one of the things in terms of figuring out who you are that you can be doing right now and it's the easiest thing of all is just start noting your course responses. So what are personality assessments? I'm gonna guess that most of you are familiar with at least the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Um, I think all of us probably get those in high school, if not undergrad programs. But if you haven't, this is a description of the kinds of characteristics that it assesses, this extroversion, introversion, sensing, intuition, etc. The Kiersey temperament test has another four, type, four types of categories. The True Colors Personality Test is another type um, that's been a little bit debunked, but you, if you love doing assessments, you might want to check that one out as well. And then the Big Five Personality Traits is the one that seems to um, be used most frequently in academic settings. I also, in addition to the career coaching work and advising work that I do, um, for San Jose, for the iSchool, I also teach a number of courses, online courses for other programs. And in one of those courses, we use the big five personality traits. That's what the requirement is. And because we've used that, I want to make this additional comment about any of these personality assessments. They've been around for a long time and they tend to associate a negativity or a positivity with these characteristics or the results of your assessments. And I want each and every one of you to understand that that is not the case whatsoever. That anything that you discover through a personality assessment is simply an indicator that gives you information that will make it easier for you to grow into your best self and to identify the environments within which you will thrive. Being an extrovert or being an introvert has no impact whatsoever on your ability to have an incredible career um, and to make wonderful contributions and do work that is terrifically rewarding for you. Similarly, agreeableness or neuroticism, which are big five personality traits, take into, in some situations and take into some degrees, can be strengths or they can really trip you up. Neuroticism, sort of in the mid range, is actually attention to detail. Um, and being very conscientious. So when we talk about personality assessments, I want to make sure that you understand they are simply indicators. Similarly with another concept that you may hear knocked around or spoken of regarding personality assessments, and it's your strengths versus your weaknesses. I tend to believe that it's not really weaknesses, they aren't really weaknesses, but it's not what your best stuff is. So when you read these books, what you will find is, I am instinctively, inherently, really, really good at some things that probably, honestly, you're not even aware of at this point. The other things that you're not as good at 
are not weaknesses. They're just not your strengths. And we want to help you create a career where to the extent and degree possible, you get to focus on your strengths because playing to your strengths or creating a career that lets your let you bring your strengths to the environment, to the workplace, to the work that you do is when your career gets really fun and really rewarding. So now let's look at your personal preferences. You may or may not have thought of these in these categories before, but usually this is how I approach it or approached it when I was thinking about the kind of career that I wanted to have and the kind of LIS um, work that I wanted to do. So none of these are likely to be, I'm, I'm totally over on this side of the spectrum or totally, I couldn't, couldn't stand to do that, but you're gonna find that you tend to lean more towards one than the other. And all you want to understand is where do you lean? So we'll take them apart a little bit, but very quickly, the generalist versus specialist. If you are in grad school, you're likely to have found, if you've taken a number of courses so far, I really wanna do 400 things that I have been exposed to right now. You're probably going to be happiest being a generalist. Or if you have gone through say three semesters and you are so into data management that the rest of the world could go on and you, you, you could just spend all of your time learning about data management and doing a deep dive into it for years to come, you want to be a specialist. You have found your happy place. And, and so that's one way to think about these, neither being a being, excuse me, being neither a generalist nor a specialist is a good or a bad thing. It is simply understanding where you will be happiest in terms of how you pursue your career. Okay, so now let's take a look at workplace environments. Here are some of the kinds of questions that you will ask yourself about what do I want in my workplace environments? Here are some, some different ways um, that, that people manage or structure organizations and work environments. And my guess is if you either think about where you're working now or where you have worked previously or might want to work, the, the kind of career you might want, some of these will really jump out at you as this would really work for me, this wouldn't. For example, a lot of the students that I work with feel it's really important to have their voice um, included in decision-making, no matter where they are in the organizational structure. If that's important to you, that's one of the things that you wanna find out about in a job interview. Another uh, question would be level of formality. For example, in my experience of academic libraries, I found that there was a very sort of rigid level of formality between tenure track and non-tenure track between those who held two master's degrees or only an MLIS, um, as well as those who ha had say a PhD. I don't thrive in workplaces or work environments where there is a high level of formality. So academic library, which could be a librarianship, which could be terrific for other people is not something that would work for me. Amount of direction, um, I'm guessing some of you have had a micromanager uh, at one point in your life. And so that's, that's a question about the work environment. What is the management expectation? What is the workflow like that works for you? For example, um, again, using myself because I've had so many different jobs and worked on so many different projects all in the information world, I tend to like 
project work. So I like that ramp up of intensity in a project. I like, I love the teamwork and I love the collaboration, but then I love when it wraps up and it's a kickback and a, a breathing space. And then there's another project. Other people really don't thrive in that kind of a workflow. They prefer a steady, predictable um, sort of environment where when they get up on a Monday, they know what their week looks like and they know that that's going to be in their comfort zone. And that's what works for them. That's how they can contribute their best performance. Scheduling is the same thing. Some people thrive on a more unpredictable schedule. Some people a more predictable. And the bottom one, the really big one is how important it is to you. And we'll go into this again a little bit deeper, um, just a minute. But how important is it to have a work-life balance friendly employer? That becomes very, very important when you have family commitments. Or it's very important if you have a really active, dynamic personal life. These are the kinds of things you want to think about for your own preferences in terms of workplace environments. In terms of interpersonal dynamics, some people love a close working relationship with their colleagues. Um, this is the group that goes bowling every Thursday night together. Other people want to have more of an arm's length relationship with their colleagues where there's less um, information exchanged, there's less uh, emotional connection. It's let's come in, get our jobs done because we've all got other stuff outside of the office that we want to focus on. Neither one is good or bad. It, they're simply the nature of what works best for you and what are you looking for. What is your response to intense interactions? Some people thrive on an intense workplace uh, where there's a lot going on. There's a lot of, I don't want to say drama, but let's say energy, um, some positive, some negative. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is very much the case when it's a startup. So if you are thinking about a workplace that might be out of a, a school, public or academic library setting, LIS skills are very valuable in businesses or nonprofits, lots of different organizations, um, but some of them come with very intense workplaces. And so you need to think about the trade-offs of here's a real cool job opportunity, but oh my gosh, these people are Looney Tunes and they would drive me crazy. So again, your personal preference and again, also, these may change depending on the circumstances in your personal life. The one that we're all familiar with, which is extroversion versus introversion, do you draw energy from people or from solitude? That will help inform a decision you might make about whether you think you can handle eight hours on the reference desk or uh, eight hours by yourself in a back office um, doing cataloging, for example. For people who thrive on solitude, one is great. For people who thrive on public, uh, a lot of people interaction, the other is great. Again, probably um, a balance, a, a somewhere on the spectrum either way between those two um, extremes but something to consider based on what you know or learn of yourself. Similarly, um, do you like to be a collaborator or do you like to work independently? Even though I classify or qualify as an introvert, I love collaborating. That's one of the reasons I love project work. So there aren't any black and whites here. There are only what have your experiences so far told you about yourself or what can you learn about yourself so you have a better understanding of what works for you? 
Okay, so now let's look at job specific considerations. And by the way, I am terrible at presenting and monitoring the chat function as well. So if you have questions for me, please don't hesitate to post those questions and I will be happy to answer them at the end and or you will have my email at the end and I am absolutely on call for all of you, <clears throat> excuse me, 24 seven while you are going through the, the iSchool program or afterwards. So I'm sorry, I should have told you that at the beginning, but Anyway, if you have questions, go ahead and post them. All right, so job specific considerations, I would, would break down as if you are not, well, I would say including libraries as industries, what industry will you work for? What organizations, what types of organizations within those industries? And for those employers, what are your personal deal breakers? These are the things, the considerations that you want to be aware of that say to you, everything else about this job might be good, but this one characteristic will not work for me. And therefore, this, this is not a job I can take. So thinking about industries, there are thousands because there are hundreds of industries and then there are subsectors within those hundreds of industries and just a million different types of work and jobs you could have within them. But there are some considerations that might be wise for you to think about when and if you think about, is this an industry that appeals to me? The first thing is, is it well, well represented where you want to live? That means if you're in Northern California, and you want to go into the publishing line using your, your information skills in publishing, how many publishing offices or companies are there in Northern California? Because that will give you an idea of how many job options will be available for you. So I would encourage you to look for industries that have a, a big footprint wherever you want to live. That might be where you are now, or it might be someplace that you want to move to. I would recommend industries that are growing rather than contracting. An example is that um, at one point in my career, I was working for the CEO of a cable television company, and I was in a position to watch the cable industry grow from 400 um, operating companies down to, I think there are now 10 operating companies. So happily, I realized really early on that I really didn't like the cable industry. Um, and so I moved on to other professional um, career pursuits. But if I were looking for a job in cable television, I would be really out of luck right now. So if you think about industries where you want to invest yourself in growing your knowledge base, look for an industry that is growing rather than one is, that is contracting. Um, again, if, for example, I'm in Colorado where the cannabis industry is growing off the charts. The, the, the growth is exponential. So far, there's not enough money in the industry and they're not big enough to realize, boy, they really need um, LIS skills. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. In addition, you want to make sure that if you're looking at an industry, it doesn't have major competitive or regulatory threats that might force it to start contracting. The bottom one is really important and it applies to libraries as well as to other types of industry jobs. You want to look as far forward as you can and, and make your best guess or do some good research about this is the kind of work I want to do, but is this the kind of work that can be outsourced or automated to someone who's cheaper than I, I 
um, merit in terms of what my skill level is. In libraries, I don't think there's going to be a lot of this happening. I think there will be a little bit of it happening. Um, but we know that what people, one of the things people value most about libraries is the personal relationships. So I don't want to panic any of you. But if you're going outside of, say, school, public, or academic libraries, and you were going to work in a different type of organization, everybody needs it in any field needs to be looking at the automation, the um, AI issue. Okay, types of organizations. Again, now we're, we're going outside of our library world. You could consider a consumer, a business or a community facing organization. A community facing organization might be a civic organization in your um, in your, your town or your, in your city. A business-facing organization is what we call B2B, business to business. And that might be working for an LIS, a library vendor who uh, sold to or worked with library consortia or large library systems. That, that is business to business. Um, those jobs could be sales, but they could also be product development. They could be account uh, management. They could be competitive intelligence. They could be market research. So that's what a business to business um, organization looks like. Consumer facing is, is the kinds of things where something is selling directly to you as a consumer. Uh, they're actually usually lots of fun to work for because they need to be really creative and they have wonderful marketing campaigns and things like that. Um, but, but that's one way of thinking about what focus you might have. Another one is, do you want to work for a nonprofit, a for-profit, or a B Corp? B Corps are types of corporations that are for-profit they're fairly recent uh, on the scene. What they are is corporations that have agreed to um, a certain set of criteria and standards in terms of aligning their work and their products with socially fa social facing um, values. So they're looking at climate justice, they are looking at social justice, they are looking at DEI impact, um, all of these different things. So B Corps are sort of a combination of what a for-profit might be doing in terms of really cool innovative products and services, and what a, a non-profit might be doing in terms of really serving humanity and society and the community. Another type of organization you might want to consider is a government agency. And, and this is not just like the CIA. This is like uh, NOAA, the National Ocean, Ocean, the Ocean and Atmosphere Guys, or the um, Parks and Service, or the presidential libraries. There's all sorts of, of interesting government agencies that use information skills. But another question around all of these is startup versus established or mature organization. If you were one of those people who said, I don't mind um, doing something that's really intense because I, I like seeing something from the very ground up. You would enjoy a startup. On the other hand, if you want to make sure that the company that you're going to work for or the organization is actually going to offer you sort of a long-term path, should you want to stay at at that point, you're probably looking at an established or mature organization that's been with us for, say, at least 10 to 15 years. And this is a voice of experience because I have um, been an executive in three different startups, all of which have gone belly up. So 
I wouldn't have given up any of the experiences ever, but uh, it was okay for me to do that because at that time I was not supporting a, a family and I had the freedom to sort of take that risk. So things to think about for what types of organizations. Other things, do you want to work for a local in organization which is likely to have a strong community footprint or a national organization which is likely to offer you greater career growth or an international organization which offers even greater career growth, really interesting opportunities. But as one of your faculty members, Scott Brown, will tell you, because Scott works for an international organization, it may mean that you are up taking a Zoom call at two in the morning so you can all be on each other's um, same time uh, spectrum there. Do you want a large versus a small organization? Benefits to each one, a large organization is usually more hierarchical and less um, innovative. A small organization, however, can become claustrophobic if there's not enough support for innovation and growth. Do you want to work for a mission-driven organization? That can be very important for those of us with information skills because it's important to us that our information be used to have a positive impact on the world around us. I feel that really strongly. And that has, um, for example, driven a lot of the career choices that I have made. On the other hand, I have also, when I was supporting a child, um, made choices based on, is this job financially lucrative? Um, because I need to be supporting a child and putting money away for college tuition. So all of these are questions, again, for you to ask yourself at this point in your career, knowing that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, all of your answers might be quite different. Now for those individual de deal breakers. These are things that may come up in jobs that you're looking at or potential career opportunities. Are you willing to do evening or weekend work? Are you comfortable with a changeable, unpredictable schedule? Um, will you need to undertake additional training? Are you willing and able and or able to work extra hours? Are you willing to focus more on your job than your personal life? For a lot of us, the answer will vary depending on what our personal life looks like. What other commitments do we have? So again, this is going to change sort of as you go through your life. But here was my personal deal, deal breaker. When I worked for the startups, it was expected that you be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to the CEO by cell phone. He was, um, not to put too fine a point on it, somewhat mercurial and unpredictable. So he was likely to be calling people at two in the morning or four in the morning or, you know, while you were at your child's wedding or things like that. And so when I was asked to take that job on, I said, I don't carry a cell phone and I will not carry a cell phone. And so if that's, if that's our deal breaker, then I'm sorry, but I can't take this job. Um, that's not likely to happen when you're in, the, in a less intensive workplace, but it's something that you need to think about. Am I willing to do this? You know, I, if I have my cell phone with me all the time anyway, what, do you, what does it matter? Or no, absolutely not. I wouldn't even consider this. It is possible that starting at a lower salary or a lower title than you have had previously can be a great career move. Or you might say, absolutely not. That is not something I will ever consider. Traveling for a job is now less frequent. 
But relocating for a job, especially for those of you who are considering um, academic librarianship or rural public librarianship, you may be asked to relocate. How do you feel about that? It may be a really cool thing for you, or you may say, absolutely not. My family's here. This is my deal breaker. Okay, so we sort of thought about what your preferences might be. How do you apply those to find your best fit career opportunities? And I will preface this by saying, this is a career long process. You will not start off probably in your perfect best fit job. Over the course of your career, you will get closer and closer and closer to it. So your job is to have those preferences in mind and then use some of these tactics to keep getting closer. So I've, I've put these as 10 to make it easy. Um, the first one is review your work history, both paid and volunteer. Um, and that can include things like babysitting. I have worked with several students who have no work history except for they've done a lot of babysitting and they know as clearly as they know anything else in their life, they will never be a children's librarian. So this is sort of reviewing the whole gamut of the work that you have done over, up to, over and up to this point in your career or your student career. Identify your strengths and the areas of this is not my best stuff. The, the reasoning behind this is that if you can know what your strengths are, then you can focus on them and develop them to a point of excellence. Whereas the areas that are not your best stuff, no matter how hard you work on it, are never going to um, be really outstanding. That's just human nature. That's not you. And so for us to get you to doing the work that you love the best, we want to focus on your strengths. And we'll have more information about how to do that. Number three is informational interviews. And we have information about how to do those um, on the website under the career development section. But also, if you're not sure about it, and you'd like more information about it, you'll have my email at the end of the webcast. I've put together a sort of information interviews uh, 101, and just send me an email and say, please send that to me, and I'll be glad to shoot it off to you. Also, note what coursework you've most enjoyed. One of the coolest things about being in the iSchool and going through the program is that you can use it to monitor your responses to what makes you happy and what you're good at. So as you go through each course, don't just learn the domain knowledge base that you're being exposed to. Also assess your reactions to what do I think about this knowledge base? What do I think about this type of work? Number five, Take some assessments, but then I would take those assessment results and compare them to what you know of your own best and worst work experiences because it will help you understand what was good about this for me, what wasn't good about this for me, and why. Another way you can use being in the program is to consider your reactions to what guest speakers or guest presenters are telling you about their jobs. If someone says, in my job, the thing that I love to do the most is X, Y, Z, and you hear that and think, uh-huh, if I had to do that, I would run screaming from the building. That's a really important benchmark for you to make. That's giving you terrific information for you to understand your own preferences. Um, and then think about your time in the program in order to go back to that first question that we were mentioning, 
which is, do I want to be a generalist or a specialist? I realized when I was grad, in grad school, I wanted to do everything. And the thought of being a specialist made me sad because it meant I would have to focus on one thing to the exclusion of a million other things that I was curious about and knew that over the course of my career, I would become curious about. On the other hand, I have uh, friends and colleagues who have become specialists, and I am in awe of their knowledge and their ability to contribute um, their skills and their growing wisdom and insights in their careers to the work that they do. So think about what this feels like for you so far in the program. Number eight, if you can, job shadow. And job shadowing is where you reach out to someone who's doing a job that you're curious about and you ask them if it would be possible for you to come in and just basically wander around behind them for a day and see what they do, how they do it, the kinds of things that come up. You know, if you have the time, do it for several days in a row so you can see the different dynamics. But as you do that and you learn about those jobs, what you especially want to pay attention to is your reactions to those job characteristics. And then nine is to read as many job career descriptions to identify best work aspects for you. Keep in mind that what works best for you is going to be radically different or, or maybe than your best friend or your best buddy in grad school or a faculty member that you really, really admire. It's unique to you and no one will know better than you will what those preferences and characteristics look like. And also, Thank you to Kelly um, for the Career Trends Report. This is the um, annual MLIS Skills at Work Report. It's just come out. It's on the website, and that will also walk you through what a lot of these jobs look like. And again, you just want to look at it and think, see, okay, I would love to do that, or yeah, those four things, not so much. And the last thing is try it out. You can try these jobs out as internships. You can try some of these things out as um, volunteers. It doesn't, you can try them out as a project that you sign on to. You don't have to make what I would call a full body commitment of taking a job, a full-time job and committing to it in order to start learning more about which of these things will work for you best. So why is this important? Here's why I think it's important. And, and some of these reasons are because, uh, as I said, I've held, pro I've, I've been on three straight out startups. I've led two other startup projects within um, businesses. And I've had probably between 12 and 15 different jobs. And when I started work, I didn't really know myself or my work preferences well enough to know why some of those really were wonderful and other ones really, really didn't work out. <laughs> and so if you know yourself, as well as you possibly can in terms of job preferences and work preferences before you launch your career or early on as you launch your career, you will understand what I consider to be a really critical difference. And that is between a wrong job, the wrong type of work for you, the wrong boss, i.e., this boss is a Looney Tune and a micromanager, and I don't do well with micromanagers. The wrong company, i.e. The, the company culture here is terrible, or the wrong industry. The more I work in this industry, I realize it doesn't reflect my personal value set. 
you will know this earlier on, the better you understand yourself, or you will be able to identify jobs that fit these categories before you actually take them, which I would tell you is way preferable than finding out after you've been in the job for a while. It will also help you understand whether you are or have been following someone else's career agenda. One of the things um, that we know when we start grad school is that pretty much everybody has an agenda for us. Uh, so ALA has an agenda for what we need to learn. Our parents probably have an agenda for us. Our spouse may have an agenda for us or our significant other. Your kids may have an agenda for you. Um, your career advisor or your um, academic advisor may have an agenda for you. Everybody with the best possible intentions has a pretty good idea of what they think that you should be doing in your career. This will help you be able to differentiate between their agenda for you and what you would describe and, and create as your own career agenda. It will help you identify, as I mentioned, hopefully before you've taken the job, the benefits and drawbacks of a specific job opportunity. And sometimes that can be difficult to do if it looks like a killer um, position. The, the kind of thing you've looked for for a long time. This will help you do a deeper dive to actually be able to tell whether that potential is going to turn into the right reality for you. It will help you be able to most effectively sell your strengths to potential employers because if you know to the greatest degree possible, why a job would be great for you, then you also know why you can, or how you can tell that um, interviewer why you would be such an effective contributor in that role. It makes it much, much easier to be persuasive and, and authentically persuasive because you know how good you would be as a contributor. It also helps you work with colleagues who don't share your characteristics or preferences. One of the things that most of us tend to do, and it's simply human nature, is assume that most people think the way we do when they're colleagues of ours. Um, we have the same values, we approach the world the same way, we, we're either process-driven, or we're not process driven, or all of these different characteristics. And in reality, all of us are breathtakingly uh, different, even when we're somewhat similar. And so knowing what your characteristics are will help you identify when you're hitting a situation where someone doesn't share your characteristics or preferences and help you navigate those differences more easily. It also, and this is really important, it also can help you understand when a job promotion might not be in your own best interest. We always assume that a promotion is a good thing, but if a promotion takes you out of a situation where you can work to your strengths and put you into a, a situation where you're not able to do that anymore and or it really highlights or calls on the areas that aren't strengths for you, that's not a good situation for you. And you are better off to turn down that promotion and wait for something to open up that does allow you to continue to grow in the areas that are the best fit for you and for your career. It is also important to know what's really worth negotiating for. For example, the situation where I was asked to be carrying a cell phone 24 seven. At that point in my life, 
that was absolutely something I would not consider doing. And so that was my negotiating point. The salary was fine. It wasn't a big deal for me. Um, I knew what the job was going to entail. They were asking me to do it. And so I knew um, that I had the, the, the characteristics in that job that I wanted to have. But that one point was my deal breaker. And so the better you know yourself when you're being offered a job or you are applying for a job, the easier it is for you to identify and quickly say, wow, I would love to take this job, but this one thing does not work for me. You may be surprised when they come back and say, we think you'd be great in this job and we will work around that issue, which is what my response was. That's how they responded to me. Um, it also helps you know not only when you're deciding to take a job that you know isn't going to be a good fit, but it helps you understand why you're taking that job. Here's an example. If you're in a situation where you're a, a parent and you've got small kids and part of your value system or your goals or your priorities are to be home when those kiddos are home before and after school. And you found a job that you don't really love and, and it doesn't really build on your strengths, but it allows you to work the hours that you need for your kiddos or for that parenting commitment. Then you can take that job knowing it's not going to be a good fit for you, but knowing that you are following a higher or more important priority. Because when you know that, you don't resent the job. You go into it knowing that you have made a trade-off. You go into it not holding anybody else responsible for the fact that you don't love the work that you're doing. You're the one who, who made that choice, and it was the right choice to make. It's a good choice to make. So. Don't feel like once you understand what your best fit jobs look like, any job you take that is not that best fit is the wrong decision. It may be absolutely the right decision for you at that point in your life. All right, so I'm going to go through these really quickly because you just, I just want you to know that I've, I've included these in this set of slides so you can go back to them and check them out. Um, personality tests, books, and here are key takeaways. The self-assessment tests that I've noted and your own work history are going to be able to help you understand the key or the critical points about what you are good at what you instinctively enjoy doing and what your best fit environment is likely to look like at this point in your life. Once you've identified those characteristics, then you can start exploring how various job options and job opportunities do or don't align. Then you can use that information to make job and career choices that come closer to offering you your best career fit. And then similarly, it will help you understand why something that isn't working, why that may be okay for you for now. Okay, so now, I'm, thank you, Sybil. Okay, can we see two slides back? Will we get to see the slideshow later? Yes. So here's what's going to happen. After um, this, we wrap this up, then I will work with the iSchool wonderful production people, and we will post it in the career development section. And this entire webcast will be available to you to review at your leisure at any point. And as well, there you see my email. And 
although it says Gail, I, it's actually Gail Kimberly. And so I go by Kim. I'm available to you for any questions that you would have at any point um, about LIS careers, about the program, about where to find information, just anything that you think of. So with that, uh, I'll, let's see, ask, have, whoops, see, do we have any other questions? Thank you, Ariel. And thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Isabel. Um, I'm glad that it was, was helpful. And I'm glad that you all won't be making all the mistakes that I've made early on in my career. <laughs> all right. So with that, I will let all of you have the, a wonderful rest of your evening. And I will look forward to hearing from any of you who have questions that I can help with. All of you take care and have a great rest of the week. <laughs>